Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, all, and it's a pleasure to be here for CEDA's uh, annual economic and political overview. And thank you to Graham and to and to Steve. And I know that this overview has been uh, held annually for over the last two decades, and it's a good context to start in that the last 20 years has been a period of significant economic growth, uh, often significant reform that led to that and led to productivity improvement, employment and trade growth that resulted from it, and also a considerable period of population growth. And these are the two great drivers um, of Australia's future in terms of challenges and opportunities. They're ones that Infrastructure Australia that I chair has been able to focus on. Um, we've maintained a very high quality of life during that period of change and we've seen, particularly for the last two decades, uninterrupted economic growth, something that other nations would be very happy to have. I often find in media discussions about infrastructure that we're uh, inclined to be drawn to the latest crisis or dispute. Um, my underlining feeling is, though, that uh, the issues that confront us in terms of infrastructure and the economy are ones that this nation would actually be proud to have. The problems we have are the problems of handling growth. Population growth, which other nations would be very happy to have, and also economic growth, which others would be happy to have. So I think we should have a good context of being positive about what we're facing. If we do, then I think we can face it with the same degree of success as we have for the last few decades. Uh, that being said, the growth is considerable, and it will mean that we have to have a lot of change. Nowhere more do we need that change and that focus than in infrastructure. And just look at population. Australia's population growth now exceeds that of our peers. We are outstripping the growth in Canada, the US, outstripping the growth uh, in the UK. And just recently, our population nationally hit 24 million. By most measures, though, um, with the economic growth and population uh, increase we've seen, Australia is doing well. Whilst we still face uh, economic risks from overseas, there's little doubt that our nation is well positioned uh, for the future. In particular because in our region that we're so well connected to, the region is going to account throughout Asia for two-thirds of the world's middle-class population and they will be seeking the exports of products and services and skills that Australia is perfectly positioned to provide. Our geographic proximity to the region and the quality of what we can offer in terms of exports, uh, it's going to provide us with opportunities for trade, growth and employment here uh, that is unparalleled we can continue the national success story as long as we're ready to cope with this growth. In infrastructure, uh, we therefore have to focus, and that's what I want to address as part of this element of talking about the future. Infrastructure Australia believes that considered and well thought through infrastructure investment is going to be one of the most effective ways for us to achieve and deliver the qualities we want out of economic growth. To ensure that we can take advantage of the opportunities, we need infrastructure that, one, strengthens our global role as an exporter of resources, but also as an uh, exporter of services and products, improving the networks and gateways, and, and boosting connectivity between businesses. Two, we need it that in, so that it meets our needs as a highly urbanised nation, enhancing the livability of our cities through infrastructure investment. And thirdly, we need infrastructure that underpins our prospects for sustainable growth by focusing more than we ever had on resilience and on whole-of-life asset management. I'm afraid to say that currently, despite recent increases in government spending and increased private sector participation, there's a real gap in the overall quality of Australia's infrastructure. Australia should be in the top 10 nationally of nations globally uh, in the way that we are positioned on infrastructure. But we're rarely regarded as being even the top 20 today. 
If we keep going this way, our performance will continue to fall behind. Our objective should be, as a nation, to be a top 10 performer. So the time has come, if we want to achieve that, to implement long-term reform and secure the social and economic benefits that come from good infrastructure. Last month, Infrastructure Australia released the first 15-year Australian infrastructure plan. The plan builds off the work we did with the Australian Infrastructure Audit last year. The plan is a roadmap, an agenda for change that Australia needs to perform better in regards to its infrastructure. It's ambitious, but it's also pragmatic and explains the change required, but also explains how to make that change happen. Delivered alongside the plan is a refreshed infrastructure priority list. The list provides clear strategic direction and guidance to decision makers on the infrastructure investments that will underpin Australia's continued prosperity. Together, the plan and the list provide the solutions for the nation over the next 15 years, which was the mandate given to us by the Prime Minister. Both are the result of extensive consultation filtered through the independent and objective lens of Infrastructure Australia's board. If we deliver the reforms and the priorities in both documents, we can capitalise on the economic opportunities of our geographic region, we can enhance the livability of our cities and our regions, and we can secure the social and economic benefits that come from good infrastructure. It's not going to be easy, but if we focus on the challenges, I think we can do it as a nation. When we released our audit in 2015, we projected that by 2031, not far away, Australia's population would grow to more than 30 million people. And this chart really in a simple form just outlines the challenge that is ahead of us. These are our projections with the Australian Bureau of Statistics of the growth that will occur by uh, 2031 and by 2061. The bottom line is that most people will live in our four largest cities which grow considerably, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth. This is, this is welcome growth, as I said, most nations would love to have it, but it'll need to be managed well. Equally, we have to focus on the fact that we need to spread that growth and I'll discuss that in my address today. A growing population is undoubtedly a source of dynamism. It provides larger domestic market for businesses, it increases the size of the labour force, and it facilitates an injection of new ideas. But growth also places more demand on cities, on regions, and ultimately it places a lot more demands on government budgets. The audit identified that if we fail to act comprehensively to harness and deal with this growth, then Australia faces a future of congestion and constraint. The road congestion alone is projected to cost the Australian economy 53 billion by 2031. This congestion has real world consequences for ordinary people. Increasing bottlenecks and delays will mean it takes longer for Australians to get to work or home. Our goods will take longer to reach ports or shops and the many services we rely on for infrastructure will decline or not grow as they need to given the increasing number of residents. In our plan, we identify that to sustainably meet our projected population growth, we need productive cities and we need productive regions. In our capitals, we need to see those cities grow up, not out, while maintaining and enhancing our world-class livability. Our cities must move to high frequency mass transit networks with turn up and go transport services that save people time and money. Smaller cities and regions need to also play their part and should capitalise on growth for themselves but also to relieve pressure on the larger cities. Better connected regions will facilitate growth and provide people with more opportunities to live and work where they want. So how do we ensure that we choose a future of livable efficient cities and productive regions? How do we ensure that this is all sustainable? Governments at all uh, levels will need to be planning for it with a long-term perspective. At the Commonwealth level, the Australian Government currently holds the principal levers to influence population growth 
and ensure we capitalise on all its benefits. It's charged with determining migration policies and has an indirect influence on natural population increases through taxation and social policies. It's also best placed to provide the long-term leadership to other levels of government. That's why we've ad advocated in the plan for the delivery of a national population policy. The policy should identify Australia's long-term population pathway over the next 50 years. It should identify the requirements to service this level and type of growth. And it should outline what the Australian government role will play in managing these challenges and opportunities. Once developed, the policy can be used to inform the development of migration policy by the Australian government and the development of infrastructure and land use planning by state and territory governments. I want to be clear that this is not about advocating a big or a small Australia. It's about ensuring that we influence our population growth as has been charted by the Australian Bureau of Statistics and influence it in our best collective interests and fully capitalise on the potential benefits for the economy and for the community. Planning our future will let us shape it. All state and territory governments will therefore need to create long-term infrastructure plans for the next 15 years and beyond, as is already occurring here in New South Wales. By doing this, governments can better plan for changes in the demand for infrastructure, identify emerging issues, and establish a pipeline of well-conceived infrastructure reforms and investments. To be effective, this planning should be integrated across different infrastructure sectors and networks and aligned with broader land use and economic development plans. In addition to this, governments need to commit to conducting more feasibility studies on proposed projects and therefore invest in the long-term planning of the future and obviously do this work before they commit capital to building them. The certain, uh, certainly we need long-term planning and, the, and resulting pipeline that will come from that of investment. It increases the quality and reduces the cost of infrastructure if we do this. A well-developed long-term plan will limit the influence of short-term thinking by providing decision makers with a robust evidence base from which to identify future infrastructure priorities. Finally, governments at all levels will need to be making specific, well thought through investments to ensure that we can build a positive future for Australia. And that's why alongside the plan, we released a refreshed infrastructure priority list. Taking the data from our audit and from our earlier Northern Australian audit that we did, IA has undertaken an assessment of our infrastructure gaps and requirements. And we have also analysed both the challenges and the potential solutions through extensive consultation with all state governments and territory governments, with peak bodies, industry and the community. Through this approach, we've developed a priority list of 93 nationally significant investment opportunities that all levels of government and all sides of politics can choose from. It's a consensus list of transformative projects. You'll never take the politics out of infrastructure, but you can arm the politicians with objective and considered advice. The priority list does this, and it deserves the bipartisan support it has received and should continue to receive in the future. Our proposed future investments will add capacity to infrastructure networks to make people's lives easier. They'll make the drive to work faster and more reliable, make the seat on the train more available, and make the water bill more affordable. These future initiatives also reflect the policy we are advocating in the plan. For instance, to support our growing capital cities, we advocate in the plan for more high capacity, high frequency public transport services across all modes. That's why in the list, we're proposing world-class mass transit metro systems in Sydney, in Melbourne and in Brisbane. Metro systems like the ones that many of you will have experienced in cities like Paris or London. We also advocate in the plan for the greater use of technology to manage the mon and monitor traffic flows 
by collecting, storing and analysing data on traffic counts, traffic times, congestion incidents and faults through sensors at, at intersections. So in our list, we're proposing a series of potential investments in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, the M4 motorway upgrade, City Link Tullamarine widening, the M80 Western Ring Road upgrade and the M1 Pacific motorway upgrade that all use that technology. As a broader piece of work, we're also recommending a network optimisation portfolio that would address congestion issues right around the country by upgrading existing road networks with new technologies such as real-time information systems, variable lane control and traffic management centres, amongst others. But we're not just advocating for investment in our major capital cities. We're also ensuring that we support our fast-growing regions with targeted smart investment that uses what we already have more effectively. For instance, the Northern Adelaide Plains in South Australia produces approximately one third of South Australia's agriculture, the equivalent of 160,000 tonnes of fresh produce. And there's growing demand for their product both domestically and overseas, presenting an opportunity to further expand export food production. An opportunity only prevented by the availability of natural water. So in our list, we are recommending an expansion of the Bolivar Wastewater Treatment Plant to make an additional 20 gigalitres of recycled treated wastewater for use in agriculture. The alternative is to invest hundreds of millions of dollars to update a treatment plant in, in order to meet stricter environmental standards for wastewater that is then released offshore. By comparison, the proposed project will increase the value of agricultural production in the area by at least $115 million per annum. This is exactly the sort of smart, better use investment that we should be looking at right around the country. And finally, in this part of our plan, we also put a heavy emphasis on conducting feasibility studies, developing business cases and preserving corridors, in other words, looking to the long term in the work that we're doing so that we can protect the future needs. Corridor preservation is a classic example of an area that has seen too little investment recently. In the past, corridor preservation regi regimes by state governments were quite well developed. But long-term corridor preservation is now often overlooked in government budgets in preference to funding near-term priorities. So in our Infrastructure Australia list, we are, for example, recommending preservation of the corridor for a rail connection to Western Sydney Airport. This will ensure that once the airport grows in capacity, and we're able to efficiently and relatively cheaply develop a public transport rail link to this large piece of Sydney infrastructure. Similarly, we are recommending the protection of the corridor for a dedicated fuel pipeline to the new airport to ensure we have efficient, safe and cost-effective transportation of jet, jet fuel in high volumes to the airport. In addition to this, Infrastructure Australia is recommending protection of the corridors for high-speed rail, on the east coast and for new ring roads that are being planned around Melbourne and Sydney. These are long-term game-changing investments that need proper planning in their very early stages. This is just an example of the projects and initiatives we're recommending as part of the plan and of the priority list. However, if, if we are to deliver more and better infrastructure to meet our potential growth, we're going to need more funding to do it and better use of existing funding. This funding task extends beyond the substantial capital investments associated with in new infrastructure. It's also got to include analysing properly the operation, maintenance, renewal and disposal costs. We'll need to find sustainable funding streams. The way to solve this problem is to reform our existing infrastructure markets. In energy, that means we should transfer remaining legacy publicly owned businesses to private ownership, in particular privatising Queensland and Western Australia's electricity assets and recycling the capital into their transport infrastructure needs. In telecommunications, that means we need to complete the rollout of the NBN and privatise it when it is completed. 
In water, it means we should establish genuinely independent economic regulation and ultimately transfer metropolitan water utilities to private ownership in a regulated market. And in transport, that means establishing a real market, routinely exposing public transport services, for example, to, con to contestable supply through franchising. If we can run Sydney ferries and Melbourne trams through the private sector, then we can do it with heavy rail as well. They are examples of reforms that are needed if we're going to deal with the causes of many of the problems we are coping with rather than just dealing with the symptoms. Infrastructure Australia's recommendations on market reforms may seem ambitious, but if we are to provide the best outcomes for users and consumers and ensure that we build a new infrastructure and maintain what we have, these reforms are going to be necessary. So allow me to conclude. With the release of the plan and the priority list, we're presenting a whole package that works together. The reforms we need to make, the investments we need to deliver, and the mechanisms to deliver both. The plan provides the vision to address our infrastructure gaps and ensure Australians have access to infrastructure that supports innovation and secures prosperity. It's a document designed to help solve the problems of today, but also to set us up to meet the challenges of tomorrow. But the plan will only be as good as the commitments that follow it. It's a strategic document and it needs to be turned into a carefully articulated action agenda across all levels of government. We've got a choice as a nation, a choice between a future that is constrained by congestion and infrastructure services that don't work well and the cost that comes with that both economically and socially. Or we've got a choice of a far more vibrant future with livable cities and productive regions, resilient infrastructure. It's what we can plan for and to me the choice is clear. These are the steps that we now need to make. Thanks very much.